All right. In this episode of Investors and Operators, we talk with Tom Wells, managing partner and co-founder of Ten Point Capital, an Atlanta-based investor in franchisors with the potential to become national brands. Tom, on your website, it says that you like to back visionary founders. So the question that I'm dying to ask is, how the heck do you find a visionary founder? You know, when you're when you're speaking with all of these. Uh, potential partners, how do you distinguish someone who truly is a visionary founder within the franchisor space and those who are not? Yeah, it's interesting. So having worked with a lot of founders over the year, I think one of the things we've learned is there's not necessarily like one prototype or archetype of founder that you see that's going to go be successful and build a dominant brand. That being said, there's some personality traits that we like to look for. I think one of them, and it's probably across all business and, and it's it's been true across everything we've done that's that's worked out really well is they are fanatical about winning. They are some of the most competitive people who just it, almost with a chip on their shoulder, but they want to find a way to win no matter what. Um, and, and that's, I think, true across all industries. But from, from the point of being in the franchise space and being visionary and creating a dominant brand, one of the things we like to see, or a couple of things we like to see early on, one... I, they focus on what their brand is and what their culture of the brand is going to be. And it, it's kind of touchy feely, but it, it every good one has a founder at the core that they sit there and they spend just a ton of time thinking about who do we want to be for our consumers? Where do we want to go? I think rather than, you know, we're going to go open one or three or five restaurants, we're going to, we, they want to go national. They want to think about this thing being across the country and the impact they can have on the world. It, it's really interesting when you talk to, to a lot of the founders because they spend a ton of time just talking about people. And it's not, it's not like, hey, I want to have this EBITDA or I want to you know, make this much money or do whatever. It's how do I build something that really helps people and we employ a lot of people and we can create career, great career paths for people and build a brand that the consumer really cares about and wants to come back to. And what's interesting is like that financial motivation is always there. Obviously, they want to win. They want to make a lot of money. They want to do well. But it's not the driver of most of their decisions. The driver of most of their decisions is like, how do I create something that becomes a household name that works across the country that I can I can have be successful for my franchisees, I can have be successful for my for their employees, for I can have be successful where the customer wants to come back. So we see that consistently. The other thing that, that's interesting to me that we see a lot of is just this ability for them to reflect and constantly want to get better. Growing a franchise system is really, really challenging. The first 10 years, are, are you make a lot of mistakes. Everybody makes a ton of mistakes. And it, in a lot of ways, it's a good thing. The ones that really differentiate have spent a lot of time being introspective about what worked and what didn't work, and they fixed it. So by the time we like to get involved, it, the best founders that are really visionary can go, okay, this is where I want to take my concept. This is what the brand is, is what the culture is. And you know, I made these lots of big mistakes along the way, but here's what I learned and here's why we don't make them. And I think... That willingness to be open to consistently getting better um, on top of just being hyper-focused on culture and people is, is a scale these systems yeah. gets us excited. Do you think that you, to what extent have you been able to identify those traits such as being receptive to feedback? Does this founder or founders, do they have what it takes from a cultural perspective and a mindset perspective? So obviously, investing in franchisor is very small industry, very very uh, niche space. So our favorite deals that we do, we spend a lot of time getting to know the founders. So we've gotten to know them for years. We've started tracking them when they were five units or ten units or or however big, and have spent a lot of time with them along the way, understanding. Here's what I'm gonna, you know, when the founder comes to us and says, "Hey, I'm gonna go open this many units, and this is what we're gonna do." Well, two or three years later, ideally, we've spent sort of getting to know them. We can see what they did. And, and generally, you know, they're going to get some of it right. They may get some of it wrong. But what we like to see at the end of that is, is just that ability to be introspective and reflective on what they've done really well and what they've done poorly uh, along the way and how they've gotten better. Um, and so not having to, we spend most of our time proactively sourcing our deals, not having to go through a bank run auction generally, where it's like, hey, here's a book on this. You're going to spend a few hours of management. Like we want your bid and we want to know what's going on. It's like, no, we've built a real relationship with the, with the teams we want to be a part of. Hopefully, we've been able to help them along the way and provide some value by with resources, introductions, whatever we can do to help along the way. But a lot of it is, you know, selfishly is getting to know them and seeing if 
they have that mindset of I'm going to get better constantly and improve and learn from what I've messed up along the way. How many franchisors are there in the U.S.? I know nothing about the space. Yeah, so there's there's about four thousand franchisors, um, and that number is remarkably consistent. What's interesting to me is some new franchisors get created every year. Some sort of drop off the map. They stop franchising. They just never got over the hump. Our focus is on high growth franchisors. So they typically need to be kind of, I would say, 30 to 300 units. They've sort of proven themselves in a bunch of markets and they're accelerating the growth. What's interesting, the industry tracks all this data, obviously. About 5% of franchise brands get over 100 units. What are those different levels in the franchisor system? For example, okay, first store, then second, then it goes to five, or what are those kind of demarcations between the levels of a franchisor? It's a, it's a little different depending on some of the sort of royalties under, underlying nature of, the, of each sort of brand and segment. But what I, what I would say is, um, to your point, 10 units is a big milestone to get across. That typically is the threshold from when you go, I'm a founder, I'm going to run around, I can go put fires out for, for my franchisees at their store to like, I probably need process, I can't do everything. I think getting to north of 25 units, you've got some heft in the system, you're starting to see, okay, this thing really has some legs, it can really be a brand. 50 and 100 units, 100 units is the real hard milestone in my mind. You get to 100 units, it's hard to go away. You've really built it. Where do you come in typically? So we'll come in as small as as 20 or 30 units. It's a little different type of situation when we get involved there. It's got to be a simpler model, something that can scale really quickly. Typically on the restaurant side, we're going to be north of 50 locations before we get involved. A couple of reasons. One is just you get to an important thing for us to see is it works in multiple markets and you can start it. We're data-driven investors. You can start to point to this data and go, okay, they open in these 10 cities and these ones work. These ones were okay. These ones maybe didn't work. And what did you learn? Um, and so we want to see a little more, a little more data behind that before we invest. And part of that is like, you think about a restaurant, it's one thing to be the coolest restaurant in like Atlanta or Nashville. But if you go to like Tulsa, Oklahoma, nobody knows who you are. They have no idea if you're going to be uh, good or bad. And you've got to learn how to get them to come to you and, and create a successful restaurant in another market or you know anything that's franchised. But we that proof point is really important to us before yeah. we invest. So let's say it's a 50-unit restaurant franchise or what is a typical check that you would write and how much capital is typically invested? Yeah, t- typically we're looking to invest between 10 and 50 million of equity. I would say our sweet spot's probably right around 20 to 40 million, sort of in the middle of that range. We like to invest in the deal. For us, that capital is, for, is sort of two, twofold. One, it um, for these founders that want to go build a dominant brand, a lot of times there's some liquidity there. They can tell their families, you know, this could all go bad and I, we're taking care of them, we'll be fine. They generally have never taken a real check out of the business along the way. They've invested so the in family. Team. Who has been there through seven days a week, 365, it comes home, it never leaves. They're like, all right, here, we can take something off the table here. Three of, three of our investments were, I think they were 16 or 17 years into the life of the business, but when we invested, I mean, it took them. So their families are going, we've been at this 16, 17 years, like a long time, never really, I mean, they've done, done well, but you know, never taken meaningful liquidity. So a good chunk is liquidity. I think secondarily, it can be growth capital for them. A lot of times there's some initiatives they want to invest in or just helping really quickly build out the rest of the resources needed to go faster. Um, but typically, a lot of the check is liquidity to make the founder comfortable. And so that that founder that's a visionary is going, all right, I'm good. I can set this money aside. My family's good. Let's go for it. Like, Let's really go build this thing. Most of the people, not even invested in, but you've spoken with, have that mindset of, I, I want more and I want to actually take this to the next level versus like, I'm taking chips off the table and I'm done with this. Like I've been doing this for 15 years, 10 years. Um, have you, what have you found in the restaurant or in the franchise or system, not just restaurants, but hair salons or whatever? Yeah, I think you get both. Um, we're intentionally screening for founders that want to remain involved. They, they don't have to run the business day to day. We can help them yeah. build a full team out or sometimes they've started that process out, but I, but I do want a founder who goes, I'm, this thing is going to be a large business and I want to be a part of it all the way to the finish or, you know, for a long time. Um, the ones that want their money and to go home and, and live on the beach, that's, that generally just doesn't fit our personality and our lens of how we want to build these things. Um, it's, it's across the board, um, what you see. Um, and where do, where do you come in in terms of the, the growth evolution of the business? Is the playbook 
you know, we're at this stage of the revolution. We are the right type of capital for this time. And the goal is let's grow it with the intention of IPO, the grow it intention to sell it to what is Outback Steakhouse? I forget the the, the Bloom, brand. Bloomin brands. Bloomin brands. Or is it to sell to, you know, FFL or a larger sponsor? Like what is what's the overall playbook? What's the big yeah. picture? I think we're interesting. Like, so we tend to think more like operators. We get very attached to our businesses in a good way. Like we love them. They're all, you know, very special to us personally. Um, we're very close with the founders. Um, and so I think philosophically, it's build a great business and you have a lot of a lot of options along the way. And we we guide our investors to we may hold these investments seven years, we may hold them 10 years, we may hold them longer. For for us, it's more can we keep do we feel like we can keep growing and executing? Do we feel like we can manage risk in the investment really well? Um and so I, I think from our perspective, go build a great business. And yes, there's private equity loves franchisors. They're very asset light. You're typically the franchisees are putting the capital up to grow. So they have great cash flow dynamics. That's always an option if you build a good one. Increasingly, you can IPO the brands. I think founders, it depends on the founder personality of whether or not they want to go in that path. Um, in a lot of ways, our job post investment is to support the founders and what they want to go do. And then Historically, at times, strategic investors will come at the Bloom and Brands of the world. There's Inspire Brands, um, which is a big one with Arby's. And isn't, it, isn't that based in Atlanta? It is based in Atlanta. Yeah, I remember, okay, actually, now I, I passed it on the highway on 19400. I was like, so is, is that a restaurant? <laughs> it, and, and what what would blow your mind is like, it, it it's, on, it's one of the largest restaurant uh, brands in the country. So they own... Um, Jimmy John's, Dunkin' Donuts, Sonic, Buffalo Wild Wings, like you, and it's just right here in Atlanta. I had no um, idea. Well, and what's interesting, Atlanta's, in my mind, the franchise capital of the world. Um, and there are more franchisors here and more franchise operations sort of in Atlanta. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a couple other big cities, but the, the consistent is a lot of consumer talent. So Atlanta's always had, you know, you have Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Delta, great consumer brands. Mm -hmm. You have a, a a lot of suburban area where customers are willing to try new things. You can get cheap real estate, you can test concepts out. And then you have a great airport that you can get anywhere in the country really quickly, um, which makes it easy when you're supporting franchisees. And so um, the other big ones, Dallas, Denver is another good franchise town. But these, these towns that have this consistent um, tend to be franchise hubs, but Atlanta is a big one. At times, strategics come in and buy brands that tends to be a little economic environment driven, just like the IPO side. But private equity has been a consistent just acquirer for the last 15, yeah. 20 years. Well, and I think that's interesting because fundamentally, you don't have a fund structure. So you're set up to be longtime investors as opposed to, you know, we have to harvest this investment in a typical private equity, you know, fund two model, fund three model. And we have to exit in this timeline. And yeah, and, and it's nice. Some of it is we're, we're I mean, I, I think we're hands on, we're operationally involved. I'm not going to go in and, you know, run segments of the business, but we're going to, over the first 24 months of the investment, really the first 12 months, be super active in getting all the infrastructure, working with the team to get the infrastructure and the growth engine set up. And so come year five, it's starting to get really, really good. Come year six and seven and eight, it's even better. And so a lot of it is, if we're going to put all this effort in and, and really go for it, we want to we're in no rush to sort of get the fruits of that, but we do want to hang on long enough to get all the benefit of that on the back end. Yeah. Let's talk about something related to franchising, which is, you know, if franchising is all about repeatability and scale, how have you applied those concepts to your profession? Like in investing at professional services with investing, how can you get repeatability into what you were doing. Yeah, it's interesting. Like we were a growing business. We, we really founded the firm about four and a half, five years ago. I think over the last two years, we've been pretty focused on how do we make this replicable? If we're going to scale and we're going to take on more um, companies, how do we do it over and over again? And so there are a couple of things. So we, we have, uh, I'll walk through a few areas. So one of the things is going into a deal. We have two scoring models we use. One, they're proprietary scoring models. One, we evaluate the concepts with. And so it's, you know, we're going to get in and evaluate how strong do we think this concept is and how quickly it can grow based on some criteria we've set up and some metrics around it. Um, the second is we have a we have a set of criteria that helps deal with how how is the infrastructure as we get in? How are the functional areas of this business get involved day one? And what are the gaps? It's sort of a, it's one, an evaluation tool, but also a gap analysis. And that dictates a lot of our post-close involvement. So we've tried to put process there. Secondarily, we have what we call a franchise acceleration plan. It's tail, it, I mean, there's a lot of replicable, replicable items in that, but it's tailored to each investment a little bit. And it's, 
how are we going to go faster? How are we going to sell franchises in the right market? How are we going to help the team support real estate and construction and really help them put their process in place? Um, and so we have sort of a process plan around how we go do that. The other really big area that we deal with, um, with the companies that we're consistent with, we tell them going in the biggest area we're going to support you and support you as a founder and support the team is there are three things, people, process, and prioritization. And so we're going to go help them from day one, evaluate the team and really think about organizational structure as they grow. How do you get the right people at the right time? Because you're always resource constrained. You can't go hire everybody day one, but a plan around that. I think secondarily, we go through the organization. It's like, where can we put process in your business? You know, is it that a lot of brands would say real estate's a little bit of an art and you have people out in the field. It's like, no, no, no. Like, yes, that is a, to a degree true, but 70 steps in this process you can put into place and let's go put those into place. And then the big one, and, and we do this internally, this is sort of segueing into what we do internally, prioritization. You talk to an entrepreneur or founder and they're, you go, what are your big things you want to do this year? They're going to give you a list of 20 things. And, and what's hard is you can't go do them all well. And so it's really supporting the founders in like, at each company, there's sort of two to four things every year. This is going to drive your business. This is ultimately, if you go do this, say it's three things a year for five years, you've transformed your business. You have a just a crazy different business that's really grown correctly. And it's helping them focus on that. And so taking that to the internal, we have what we internally and it with the companies, we set our own goals. So like, here's where we're going to focus. Here's what's going to move the needle for the investment and for our investors. And we we have a cadence around meeting and, and really taking those big goals and breaking them down into smaller goals and executing against those. And so that process started with the portfolio companies, but we've moved it internal. What do you think has been the most difficult challenge you have faced in terms of repeatability in things that you outlined in the past four to five years that you you know really had to you know work hard on it, like in year three and four? It's all people. Everything is people <laughs> in this world. Like, and so it, it's interesting. Like a lot of these things, we've seen this movie a lot because we've invested across a lot of growing franchisors. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to have the right people, both both internally on our team and at the company to execute really well. And so I we can sit there and, and go into an investment and say, here are the three things that need to be done this year. Here's your priorities. Let's get, let's all agree. And if you don't have that team, it never gets done correctly. Is we've intentionally built our team out. So there's three of us day to day at 10 point. One of my partners, Morvin Groves, who we brought in is an ex-consultant, but she was an operator. And so we we sort of said, okay, I'm a little more of a deal guy and, and a strategy guy. My partner, Scott's a little more of a strategy guy. Morvin really helps us. She's got a strategy background, but helps us bridge between, hey, here's what you should do and here's how we go execute. And so we sort of purposely built this team that can go really implement product. We can help identify you know, where the opportunity is, we can go implement process and go execute against it. But for us, it's been consistent internal, external, it's people that drive these. Yeah. How, do you, how did you kind of grow through the that topic of it, in investing in people, training people? And I'm asking that because we w- just went through this in December where we use the EOS uh, framework and Gino Wickman's Wickman, book Traction, doing the people analyzer, doing the organizational checkup. And that kind of gave us a lot of insight such as we didn't have a vision, not just for the company, but then more importantly, for the individual. And mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have, looking at the uh, three uh, you know, employees that we have, like what is, what is actually your vision for your career? How well do we fit into this you know, at this stage of your career, at the next stage? And to, to really shift things away from what are our goals, what are, what's our vision to first and most importantly, where are you at and how can we support that? You know, that's one of the things that we went through, but I'm curious, like when you're talking about people are the most important thing, what are maybe some specific things that you guys have worked through? At the company level, I think we leave that up to every founder, right? Or every, you know, management team at the company. It's a very personal thing of how you go run a business. And I'm not going to go tell you, you've got to use, you know, EOS, you've got to use some other framework to go execute. I think that's, that's something each founder has got to develop their own style and figure out what resonates for them. Because some are much more of like, I'm going to be in front of everybody and much more motivational and rah-rah. And some of them are very sort of almost introverted and they, they want to step back and let their, their team go execute. What we do want to help them with is at the company level, let's set a vision. Let's be very, very clear about what that vision is, both you know internally with our franchisees, with our employees. Um, and then let's, to your point, spend time and set goals and a development path with every employee. And one of the things we, we have had to do over time, and coach, I, 
if we do our job really well at the, and the companies do their job really well, we're going to lose employees over time. They're naturally going to develop really well and they're going to go on to better career paths. They, you know, they're going to get a job that we ultimately don't have for them. They're going to go be a CFO somewhere or go be a CMO somewhere. We have those roles. And so I think in our minds, if we can work with the employees, give them a vision, explain, be very transparent about what we're trying to do and how we're going to get there and what our goals are and, and be very clear with them about what their goals are, we're going to support them in getting there. And so I don't, it, it's always a sad day when you, when you have an employee leave to go take on a better role somewhere else. But ultimately, if we can do a job sort of motivating, training, working with and developing people, they're going to either move up in the organization because we have room or they're going to go find a better, a better role elsewhere. And in a lot of ways, that's that's the restaurant industry. I think like it's one of those unique industries. It's it's most people's first job is in a restaurant. They we we like to talk about it as it's a, uh, an on ramp into the workforce. They'll hire anybody to work in a restaurant. How I got through college. <laughs> and, and and what's great is like for a lot of people, it's not for them. It's it's a it's a means to an end. They go work for six months or however long in a restaurant, and they move on to a better job, and they keep moving on with their career, and that's awesome. But for the people who love it and tr- and love people and love just that opportunity to serve other people, they can build a career in that space. You, I mean, you can literally show up and work in a restaurant. It doesn't matter your educational background. It doesn't matter anything about where you came from. If you're really good at it, ultimately over time, you'll you'll move up and you'll run restaurants. And someday you'll probably find a partner and own restaurants. And so I think it's just having it that core. It's like, how do you go identify talent and help them develop? I wish I had like some sort of magic around process, but it, it's been just for us being transparent and, and trying to be communicate, set goals with everybody. How do you bring the, what do you have, four or five investments right now? We've got, we actually have three right now. Um, we sold one last year, so three. Congrats on that. Um, yeah. How do you bring the franchisors together? And what is the cadence of that so they can share ideas, best practices, what's working you know, at a restaurant and things that we can use at our hair salon? Or how, how do you bring them together? Yeah, what's interesting. So, so that we have two restaurants, we have a, a to your point, sort of a hair salon chain. Um, and we, um, it's interesting, we have not been informal about it. What a lot of what we do is spend our time with the companies and, and, and we have a cadence for reporting monthly and, and quarterly. We're learning a lot of it is we're learning as much as we can from, from the team so that we can help figure out where somebody pops up with a real estate issue or somebody pops up with a, you know, accounting issue. We can connect them over to one of the other brands to get them talking. But generally, we found the best thing we can do is get out of the way. And so it's it's you know we have the companies in our in our sort of ecosystem. We have some some people we've known a long time in the industry that we sort of have a, a sort of a small ecosystem that we like to share best practices amongst amongst. But in the, in the best way possible, we want to connect and get out of the way because the last thing I want to do is tell a, a management team, hey, this co- other company does X, Y, and Z. You should do that. I'd much rather them say, hey, they do this thing over here. You should go talk to them. And you can work through how they got to that decision and what process they ran. And, and maybe you all ultimately come up with a different decision, but maybe you come up with the same outcome. Um, similar to customer referrals, it's, it's one thing for you to tell them you know everything and you're the best. It's another thing for your the companies to tell each other what they think about specific just best practices. And so we that's that's been the biggest way we've done it. And, and the, the management teams at the companies are all close to each other. We've, one of the big ones is at the CEO level. Um, as we all know, CEO is about the loneliest job you can have. And so we we like to connect the CEOs because the only other ones that know what they're going through are the other CEOs of the portfolio brands. And so um, I mentioned we sold a company last year. That the CEO of that brand, Charles, is an operating partner of ours. He still spends a little bit of time with the companies. Sometimes he shares his thoughts on best practices. Sometimes our companies are able to share with yeah. him their thoughts. What was the brand? Tropical Smoothie Cafe. How long were you investors in it? We we uh, were investors for eight years, so a little longer hold. Were, we, we, yeah, what were some of the highlights of, of that eight years? There's a couple things. Um, so we grew up from 250 units to about 900 units at exit. Um, when we invested, the average store did about 450, 500 thousand of revenue. When we sold it, the average store was doing 860 thousand dollars of revenue. So that franchisee who came in was making a lot more money over time. I think the other big things for us was just seeing the number of franchisees who made a significant life-changing amount of money by being involved with the brand. So we love the franchise business model. I think it's one of the sort of American, it's just a, a core component of the American dream for a lot of people. You can come in, you can buy a franchiser and you can you can grow the grow your unit count, make a lot of money. So seeing that amongst the franchisee base. And then I, for me, honestly, the biggest thing was seeing the development of the people in the team. So we helped um, build that team out and, and ultimately they sort of built the, the team out themselves. But 
seeing that team develop personally and, and have a good, a great, obviously great financial outcome at the end, but seeing just where they had built their careers to and how well they had done. And now obviously they've outgrown us. They don't need us anymore. They're out continuing to be incredibly successful. Um, brings me a lot of joy. And that was one of the, the cooler things uh, to, to see. Shifting gears a little bit. I work with a lot of transitioning veterans. And I think franchising is a really interesting path that they should consider. So I was wondering if you could kind of outline who are franchises for and who are they not for? It's interesting. So the franchise industry, there's there's a lot of veterans that come in and are franchisees. The industry loves having veterans as franchisees. And there, there's a bunch of reasons. But it, uh, so franchising works best in my mind for a franchisee when they're sort of sales oriented and process driven. And so that's that's part of why if you come out of, of service, it's, <laughs> that tends to be a lot of what you spent your time doing is, is following process. And so it, ultimately, you're looking for a brand that has good process in place that you can go execute. And so the best sort of veterans that come in and do really well in franchising are like, they go follow the process that the brand has in place and do it really well. They tend to be sales oriented. I think it's a little bit, um, some people view franchising like I'm getting this brand, I can sort of open my store or my junk removal business or my whatever, and business just comes to me. And that's not the case. You've got to get out and hustle and really focus on that. And so for a veteran that wants to follow the process and, and can be sales oriented, it is an incredible opportunity. I think the other thing is there's two ways to do it. When you can go buy units from existing franchisees, there's a lot of systems where there's just units for sale and they can go build a base business and keep growing. The others, they can go to partner with the brand, go work with the brand and build units from, from scratch. And they, I think for a lot of veterans are really good at it. The other thing I like is if you've been in, in military, generally anything you're going to experience in the real world is pr- probably not that scary to you. And you've dealt with a lot more <laughs> difficult situations in your life. So it, it tends to be to your point, they don't want to go be an analyst. They're like ready to handle business and ready to lead an organization. They've done it in the military. They've they've dealt with way more stress than they're going to have to deal with in the real world. And so they tend to be really good for it. Um, where And this is true for all franchisees, where it's really challenging is if you're like a diehard entrepreneur and you want to do everything yourself. Um, that is tough in a system where the brand has a lot of control. They want you to follow their process. I, the other one that may be tough is if you're in a really early brand where they haven't built all the process out yet, uh, you know, units one to 20, uh, they, there's not much process in place yet. And so that can be tough because you get into a system and you expect the hand holding and the support and you don't necessarily get it. But are, are there it, better economics on sub 20 unit brands? No, not, not, I mean, I mean, I mean, so, opportunity for uh, the franchisee of like, this is not 900 units. There's more opportunity here. Or what would you do if you were call it, you spent 10 years active duty, you're coming out. You're like, I don't want to do a franchise conceptually, not the industry restaurants, hair salons or whatever it is, but like conceptually, what should they look for? I, so I think it's, I think it's very personality driven. So I like, I personally could never create a concept you know, I'm not the idea guy from start, from scratch. That's why I have so much appreciation for it. I couldn't do a one to 20 unit chain. It would drive me nuts to not have all the process fully baked out. I'd much rather come in at 100 or 200 or 300 units where it's it's been thought it's been thought out. They've made a bunch of mistakes and learned from those mistakes. And I'm just going to execute against the process and I'm going to go sell. You know, a, that being said, when you get involved later, territory is not going to be avail- available. So if, you're, if your family's from Charlotte, you want to go back to Charlotte, well, that concept probably sold Charlotte it, you know, it had 20 units. And so it, it's a little bit of sort of deciding where you want to get involved. Early on, there's going to be a lot of territory. You're probably going to be a little more involved with helping the brand set up that process and, and grow the brand. You, you have the potential to grow to a big number of units and really do it. You know, as you, as you go involved, say you want to go do a, I don't know, a fast food, a Wendy's today or McDonald's or whatever, like all that territory is gone in the US. There is nowhere to go. You can, you can go probably buy some units, but you can't go develop. And so those are probably the big differences outside of just the processes in place, yeah. the bigger. I wonder if there's a, another opportunity around like the operation side to build out the processes. So let's say you have a founder who's built five units or 10 units and they need that VP of ops from the operational side um, or most like a chief of staff position that helps to build out processes. And all they did in the military was like building out processes. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, I think all these brands, once they hit that like five and 10 and 20 unit stage, need that person to get in and drive process. And, and what's funny, and even at 100 or 200 units, there's still some of that. When we get involved, a lot of times the founders 
entrepreneurs don't love process always. And so the founders are always like, we, a lot of it's, let's help you build this team out. And oh, by the way, you need to focus on process. And I'm like, and we'll go help you find somebody who loves process that like gets them out of bed in the morning. And they're like, the founders are always like, this sounds terrible, but help me find that person. Cause that's there great. are actually people who <laughs> exist <laughs> who like process. <laughs> well, it's funny. Cause I'm very much like the visionary, uh, not the integrator type of mindset, but it's at that stage where, you know, for us to go to the next level, we're finally at that stage when you have to have process and I can't run this, you know, we can't run this like a, a glorified freelance, you know, sub 10 person firm, we have to build the foundation. And that's kind of where the stage that we're at right now is that, you know, the beginning of that next chapter of you have to have SOPs, you have to have process. Otherwise, you can't scale beyond 10 people for what we're particularly doing. And, and I think franchisee and, and franchisor need that. Uh, um, I think every operator would love to have someone who can get in and sort of manage people and run the process and make sure everybody's held accountable. And that tends to be a hard role to find. And I, people coming out of the military are trained incredibly well for that. Yeah. Um, I think if you've been a high performer and, and you've been in the service and you come out, the other thing you've dealt with is you've managed people with from every different background, with mm. every different sort of life situation, with every different thing that's ever happened. To, and you've learned yeah. to connect to them and help them develop and grow and be successful. And that's what you got to do in a restaurant because you have, or any sort of franchise brand, but you have people from every background that you're trying to train and develop and support. Yep. And it's a, just a natural fit. I love this, but appreciate you taking the time to do this and looking forward to, to sharing this. Yeah, that was great. I appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon.